We are uh, reading uh, Romans chapter 8, page 1137. And we're going to read from verse 18. And remember, we remember too that we were talking about uh, the sufferings that Christ underwent, not for our sin, but simply as being a sinless man living in a sin-filled world. And part of that suffering was to bring him as a man to maturity, not moral maturity because he was perfect, but to bring him to that maturity of person where he would withstand all these things. And then we saw that uh, he uh, did that also to be able to sympathize with us in our sufferings. So let's read uh, page 1137 and verse 18 of Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Sorry, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn, or the first ranking, among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who, entered, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Let's turn to, to Hebrews. Um, and we're in Hebrews chapter 2. And let's read um, from the second chapter. Uh, this, as I said, is really the conclusion of a message that I began this morning. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, because I was preaching a, another textual sermon tonight, it seemed wiser and better uh, to set that aside and to continue uh, our message of this morning uh, tonight. So we're, we're thinking here about Jesus in his person and in particular how he is better than the angels even in his humanity. And so we've reached now verse 14 and we want to read from verse 14. It's page 1204, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. And this is the bringing things to a conclusion for the writer in this subject. This is the last time he will touch on um, the, uh, the person uh, of, uh, of Jesus and how he is better by far in his person. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, or it could also be when tested, he is able to help those who are being tempted and tested. Amen. Well, keep your Bibles open, please, as we come to look at these verses uh, together. So we have, this has been our third major study in Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. And we are seeing uh, how Jesus Christ is better by far. That's the big theme of Hebrews. Uh, he's better in his person. Uh, and that's the theme of chapters 1 and 2. And so the writer has shown that by uh, um, uh, referencing the Old Testament prophets. Uh, they were those through whom God had brought um, and given his message in the past. And the writer says, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, by a better revelation. And then we saw in our second study that he's better than the angels. And of course, angels had a major role in the Old Testament church. Major angels still have a role uh, in the church today on behalf of believers. Um, and we saw last week that we weren't going to prescribe what that role is, but how wrong it is when people focus on angels and lose sight of the Christ. And so we saw that he is better than angels because uh, of the work uh, that he uh, has done, because of the place that he occupies in heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father. And the angels at their very best were only ministering spirits to the Christ. And of course, as we said this morning, that immediately invites a question in the minds of some of these Jewish believers because they're now grappling with this question, well, if Jesus is better than an angels, yet he is a man, well, does not the scripture say that man is lower than the angels, under 
the angels. And so we're answering that question that Jesus is better than angels even or also in his humanity. We thought this morning in the first place, uh, and I'll just touch on these briefly for the benefit of those with us tonight, uh, how Jesus Christ um, is one of us, one of us. He took flesh and bone uh, to himself, and uh, the writer says, yes, we don't see everything uh, in subjection to humanity now as God had created things in the beginning, as God intended things to be throughout uh, human existence. But, but we see Jesus. And everything is in subjection to Jesus. And you remember we, we noted the emphasis that is given to that word subjection. Uh, it's found in verse 5 and it's found in verse 8 three times. So Jesus, one of us, a human being, uh, to whom all things are now in subjection. The very enemies uh, of God in this world, um, the uh, progression of history, uh, what's happening in your life and my life, all of those things are in subjection to Jesus Christ. And of course, we ask the question, are all things in subjection to any angel? No, they're not. So there's why Jesus, in his human nature, uh, is better than the angels. So we saw that he was, he's one of us, but then we saw, secondly, he is one with us. And we saw in the next section uh, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2 from verse 10 through to verse 13, this repeated reference uh, of uh, terms such as sons and children and especially the word brother. So Jesus looks upon uh, all those uh, who, whom uh, he saves as children. They are um, the children of God. Look at verse uh, 13 where he says, um, Here am I and the children whom God has given me. Uh, so he's one with us. Um, he looks at us as brothers and sisters, as sons. And that means that he is with us in every experience of life. He's with us in every context of life. He's with us in every responsibility of life. And of course, our writer to the Hebrews wants to bring that out, especially with regard to the church. And so we saw verse 12. Here's how he's with us. Um, when we come together in church, either morning or evening, or preferably both on the Lord's Day, we are in the presence of Jesus, who is now King, the one to whom all things are subject. And look at what Jesus does in verse 12, when he is in our midst and when we gather in his name. He says, I will declare your name, not your name and my name, but he's speaking to God. I will declare your name to my brothers. So Jesus actually comes among us each time we meet in worship to teach us. But also look at the next verse. In the midst of congregation of the church, I will sing praise to you. So he's not only our teacher, he is our worship leader. How important that is in a day and generation when people are infatuated with worship leaders and all kinds of additions to worship. The church doesn't need any worship leader because Jesus Christ is the worship leader. And it is in Jesus Christ that we are able to worship God alone. So, um, Jesus Christ 
uh, one of us uh, brings out the note of subjection of all things to Christ as a man. Jesus Christ, one with us, brings out the whole emphasis that in worship, he's the one we are looking to. He's the one who's teaching us. He's the one who's leading us in, um, in praise. He's the one who helps us in prayer. He's the one who puts it in our hearts to give of our money uh, to the work of Christ's kingdom. So Christ is in every aspect of the worship. When we come to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, the sacrament is about him. When we come to baptism, the sacrament is about him. It's about the work that Christ did so that the Holy Spirit cleanses us and works in us that salvation that Christ accomplished. And you see, the great tragedy uh, in the 21st century is that Christ in the church is being pushed to the sidelines and man is being brought into the center more and more in every aspect uh, of the worship of the church. And the reality is that that offends God. And we see in Revelation that God will deal with that kind of church. He will take away the lampstand and he will raise up other faithful churches where Christ is given the preeminence, first, middle, and last place, not man, for he is the only perfect man, and he's the only one deserving of first, middle, and last place in his church. That brings us then thirdly this evening then. Uh, we've seen Jesus Christ, one of us. We've seen Jesus Christ, uh, one with us. And both of those make him better than the angels. And now we want to see thirdly, Jesus Christ, one for us. One for us. And that makes him better than the angels also. We might ask the question at this point, well, what's it all for? Why did Jesus go to the length of becoming a man, a human being, one of us? Why did he become like you, like me? Why did he become one with us, a brother, um, and uh, so that we are sons of God? Why was it necessary? What had gone wrong that required this unusual action on the part of God the Father to send his Son and the part of God the Son to come as a human to this world, to take a human nature to himself uh, alongside his divine nature that he always had from eternity so that we have in Christ two natures in the one person, the divine and the human. And the answer is very simple. He did it for our salvation. He did it for our salvation. And verses 14 to 18 really paint two broad brush strokes to show what Jesus Christ as a man accomplished for you and for me and for us in our salvation. Well, let's look at verse uh, 14 and let's actually read uh, verse 14 through uh, to verse 18. And as much then or since therefore uh, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We'll stop there for the moment because that's our first, um, as it were, aspect in, uh, of what Christ as a man accomplished for us in salvation. And it's one word. Victory. Victory. We were defeated men and women before Christ died and before we came to the dead, resurrected, risen, reigning, exalted Christ. 
We were dead in what? Dead in sin. Dead in trespasses. And we read this morning from Mark chapter 3. And what did Jesus say? He said we were, we were like um, uh, uh, captives in the house of a strong man. We were like uh, goods in the house of a strong man. The devil was holding us captive. And look at what he says there. Um, he himself likewise shared in the same flesh and blood that he through death that he might destroy him who had the power of death. You see, from the very moment Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They lost life with God and they became dead in sin and they actually entered into the bondage and the service of the devil. So every non-Christian is actually not in a position of neutrality. Sometimes people say, well, I can't decide whether I'm for Christ or against Christ. I can't decide whether I should receive Christ or not. I'm neutral. There's no such thing as a neutral person, God says. We either belong to the devil by virtue of this fall of Adam and Eve and the entry of sin into them and into us, or we belong to Christ through his death uh, applied to us and now at work in us so that the devil is driven out and we're, we're, we're rescued from him. We're like the plunder in the house. We're taken out of the devil's house. And where are we put to? Put in God's house. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forevermore. And this word might destroy. It's a very powerful word in verse 14. That through death he might destroy the devil who had the power of death. Um, a good illustration in Northern Ireland would be the um, process 25 years ago where all weapons, supposedly of paramilitaries, all weapons were being destroyed, rendered inoperative. They would never function again, we were told, in the destruction of human life. Now, that promise may have been kept, may not have been kept. Uh, we don't know all things. God knows all things. But here's what we do know. Mm. We know that when Jesus Christ decommissioned the devil, when he died for his people, he decommissioned the devil from having authority in their lives. And when he comes to you and me in salvation, that's him, as it were, taking us then, and applying that to us, taking us out of the devil's service and decommissioning us from the devil's service and putting us into his service. How important he achieved victory. Victory for sinners. Victory for sinners. And then verse 15 goes on to speak uh, of another, uh, uh, another dimension of this, another side of this, um, uh, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It's just another way of saying, here's what it means to live under the devil. It's to live a life of fear of death. Now, if you were to do a survey in Enniskillen tonight, many people would say, I don't even think of death. I've no fear of death. But let them tomorrow have a meeting or an appointment with their doctor or a consultant in the SWA. And they're told that they have days, weeks or months to live and I will guarantee every last one of them will have the fear of death then, if not now. The problem is that it is there now but they like the child with the jack-in-the-box, when the handle is turned and somebody close in their family dies or some friend dies, 
What does a child do when you turn the handle and the, the jack in the box? The jack pops up, death pops up, and they slam the lid down. And yes, for a day or two, while their friend or their family member is dead, it will be in their minds, but then a week later, or a month later, or unless they are very, very close, and unless it's been a, a very tragic death, uh, many people just get back into life. And that fear of death, which is the result of the fall. Adam had no fear of death when the Lord was walking in with, in, with him in the garden and when he was obeying the Lord day by day. We have a fear of death because of our disobedience to the Lord and our separation from the Lord. And so um, the, the writer to the Hebrews says, because Christ has destroyed the devil, then those that he delivers out of their sin to himself, what does he do? We no longer have the fear of death. Because as we read in Romans chapter 8, death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. As someone put it like this, um, it doesn't mean that somebody doesn't have concerns about the process of dying. In other words, will I be in great weakness? Will I be in great pain at the end of my life? But they have no fear of where they're going because they know where they're going. They know that they are with Christ. They're in Christ. And when they die, they will be with Christ. That's the victory Christ achieved for sinners. Many of us here this evening, many of us listening to this tonight are able to say, thanks be to God, I know that victory in Christ. My sin has been paid for by him. It has been cancelled. It has been applied. His salvation has been applied to me by the Holy Spirit. And I no longer have fear of death. No, indeed, I know that in the moment of death, it's the gateway to life eternal, life in heaven. But there may be some who are listening, either in person in church tonight or later virtually, and we say to you, do you know the victory of Christ in your life? Have you yet humbled yourself before him because that's where salvation begins when I humble myself in response to God and I say I'm a nobody and I deserve an eternity in hell. I humble myself. Have you humbled yourself? I confess my sin. Have you confessed your sin and named your sin? But then you see, it's not just about confessing our sin and saying, well, I've said that. It's about realizing that that sin is an offense, an infinite offense to a holy God. And so that causes me to beg mercy, mercy, mercy in Christ. Lord God, my sin deserves hell. But in Christ you give salvation. You show mercy. Mercy me, the sinner, as the publican cried out in the temple. And so, humbling ourselves, confessing our sin, begging for mercy, well then the eyes have got to look upwards. It's not about looking out and finding some coach in life that will help us overcome our sin. It's not even about joining a church and saying, well, I'll go along there and I'll do my best to overcome sin. No, we have to look up to Christ in heaven, putting our trust in him. Not only did he die for my sin, but he now calls me to follow him in a new life, leaving that sin behind. That's faith and repentance. 
And you see, that's what's happened to these men and women. That's what happened to many of us here tonight. An unbeliever, that's what needs to happen to you. You need to humble yourself before this holy God. You need to confess your sin. You need to beg for mercy. You need to put your trust in Christ. You need to turn and follow Christ from this point on. Have you done that? Have you done that? All who have, have victory. They are delivered from their sin. They're delivered from the fear of death. Yes, it's a good question, Melvin, to be asked back. Have you? Have you? So we come on to see then not only victory for sinners, but the, here's the other word, beautiful thing about Christ becoming one of one for us. Are the angels for us? Yes, they're for us. They, they're for us in the sense when God sends them to do this or that or the other thing. But they are not for us in the sense that they cannot deliver us from sin. They could not destroy the devil. In fact, the devil was one of their number. He's one of their number. And so like couldn't destroy like. In the same way as I or you cannot uh, destroy uh, sin in our lives. So the angels could not deal with the problem of sin that the devil, one of them, had brought into the world. Had to be one greater. That greater one is Christ Jesus. Uh, it is the man, Jesus, in his obedience, life, obedient life and death. Um, so then let's notice the second aspect here. As we look now at verses 17 and 18, and we'll come back to verse 16 at the end. I'm not writing it out. Uh, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. Notice what Christ is now described as. What's his ministry? He is a merciful and faithful high priest. And he is able then to help and to aid those who are tempted. And how wonderful that is. He had to be made like us in order to be able to minister to us. So Christ, Jesus Christ won the one for us in the victory that he's achieved over sin for sinners, but also in the ministry that he has established to sinners. The ministry. And those of you who are here this evening as believers, you know that ministry in your own heart and life. You know that when you fall and fail Christ again, he doesn't throw you out. He puts down his hand and he lifts you up and puts you on your feet again. He's a merciful high priest. And you see, that's the problem of trying to please, that we have when we try to please Christ through a life of good works or a life of religion. What happens when you fall? You're trying your best. What happens if you are uh, following religion uh, and you fall? Well, it's like a kick in the guts and there's nothing and there's no one to come alongside you and to say, it's all right, it's all right. I understand. And I am here merciful. And I will forgive you afresh and anew as you beg mercy and as you look to me and he's a faithful high priest. What does that mean? Well, it means he'll do that for you today. 
And he'll do it for you tomorrow. And he'll do it for you the next day. And he'll do it for you every single day until he takes you from this earth. There's never a day when you will go to him and you'll say, and he'll say to you, no more, no more. You've asked for too much. You've committed that sin too often. No, he is a merciful and faithful high priest. And he's able to be that. Why? Because he's God? No. No. But because he's man. Because he's man. Alongside being God. And he has suffered. Look at verse 18. He has suffered being tempted. So he knows what it is for pe- to be tempted. And he knows what it is for us to be tested in life. And he's able to aid us. Indeed, the only reason why you and I continue to sin who are believers. It's not because of any weakness in what Christ has done. It's because we don't look to him enough for help. And we allow our own desires. We allow the world around us. We allow the devil to come in and compete with the word of Christ. And so when we sin, there's that battle that goes on, or when we're tempted, there's that battle that goes on within us. And so often it is the old nature, or it's the world, or it's the devil that has the victory, not the Christ. But you see, there's everything there in Christ for us to overcome sin. That's the ministry he's established to aid those who are tempted you and me and others like us he knows what it is to be faced with the devil to be faced with sin to be faced with death and he knows how to be merciful and he is always faithful he does not let us down he will not give up on us He's always there to stand between the Holy Father and you and me to bestow mercy on us. And that brings us finally to verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Jesus became man Not to give help to angels, but to give help to those who, like Abraham, are believers. He's one for us. He's always looking out for us. He's always there to give help to us, whatever the circumstance, whatever the challenge, whatever the difficulty. And even when it comes to death itself, what does the psalmist say? When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Why? Is he a brave man? No. You are with me. The faithful high priest, the merciful high priest, Christ will be with you, with me who believe when we walk into the valley, the shadow of death. He lead us through it, into the Father's house. And so, we can sum it up like this. Why would these Jewish believers turn back to Old Testament worship? To angels? When they now have access through God, to, sorry, to God, through one who is better than the angels as one of us as one with us as one for us and the same question the writer to the Hebrews poses to us if we are finding the Christian life hard and uh, we think it's not what it was Um, um, said to be and we'd be better just going back to our old way of life and the uh, whatever that was then 
the Lord says to us, why would you turn back to that and leave him who is uh, one of you, who is with you and who is for you? Jesus Christ, better than the angels, even in his humanity. Amen.